Hello everybody, James here, Storytime with Dutch episode 60. In fact, Dutch, why don't you do the books uh, very quickly and you've got two in front of you, one upside down. Well, people write me all the time and they say, hey, how can I get those books? Very simple. You can write me on Gmail at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at Gmail and ask me what the details on them are and I'll get right back to you. <laughs> Because I have nothing else to do except maybe me and the, my dog sit around and drink a little bit. So, but if you like old school wrestling, these are the two books for you. And I'm writing another one. I just haven't come up with a name name for it. But this will take in my WWE days when I was uh, Zeb Coulter, how that was supposed to turn out. And a lot of other things that that weren't in the first two books. And I can sit around and just think, I just, if my thoughts could think that they'd already be out there, but now I got to sit down and what I could do now, I could, since they have artificial intelligence, which is more intelligence than I have, I could just think it up, throw it, throw it to the artificial intelligence and have them write a book. I just got to go in and straighten a few details I, out. I've, I've got a really funny fact for you. So we have uh, this AI that follows, so football, our football that follows the ball like for, from for 90 minutes like follows the ball everywhere and it helps with you know referees decisions except for the time a referee turned up and he had a bald head and the ai intelligence thought that his bald <laughs> head was the ball no <laughs> so so the camera so the automatic camera followed his bald head the entire 90 minutes and no decisions were were made properly from uh, from that too, camera that's too much anyway if you're interested in books uh Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. Also, if you would like a University of Dutch college diploma that says you have a PhD in the wrestling arts, write me at the at the same address, email address, and I'll get back to you on that. I think the price on that is like $45, and I pick up the shipping on it. But you can hang it on your wall. When somebody comes in and wants to argue wrestling, you can say, where do you have your degree in wrestling from? They say, well, I don't have one. And you can say, aha, I do. And point to it on the wall. University of Dutch with your name prominently displayed underneath it. Therefore, uh, verifying your studious uh, activity in the past. Mm -hmm. I've got two books as well. Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, the finest biography ever written on The Rock. And, of course, Owen Hart, King of Pranks, the finest biography, as well as a documentary, uh, documenting of 160 or so of Owen Hart's finest pranks over the years. We've got T-shirts as well. Respect the stash, of course. You've got a We The People thing, but we don't sell that. But, oh, but we, we don't sh- sell it. But we should. And another one, <coughs> we, uh, sorry, you people mean nothing to me. The Continental T-shirt classic. Give us five stars on iTunes. That's pretty much it. We're going to be talking Dutch about heroes of One wrestling. thing. Yep. You, you brought up Rock Johnson. Yep. <clears throat> the Rock. Oh, yeah. Dwayne Johnson. He just got $50 million from Amazon. Already got the money, I heard, for a, an upcoming movie. They didn't even name the movie, but he got $50 million. I don't get it. But now that that movie is going to be delayed with this actor strike and the writer strike. See, these studios think they can make these movies without, without writers and actors. And they and the big holdup on that is, is what we were just talking about, the AI. They can make those movies and use those CGIs or whatever the images. Well, yeah, they can, but that's going to knock the actors out of work. So they're fighting that. But without the writers, where are they going to come up with these ideas? The AI is going to make up the ideas. I've seen a lot of movies with a lot of thought put in them that were the absolute crap. So I can imagine what an AI machine would come up with. I don't know. Do you go so, to the cinema often, Dutch? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, well, who could go to the cinema? I got uh, I got fifty thousand movies sitting right in front of me. Yeah, but I, I went yeah. I went to go see the latest Indiana Jones, and it was a bit uncanny valley. He tried to de-age Harrison Ford. I, I told you this, didn't I? He tried to. You de- did. Yeah, but you were you were drunk. Mm. 
and wasn't making a lot of sense. So, and it was dressed like Indiana I, I, Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but but I heard that. But I heard they also tried to do Robert De Niro in that latest Godfather movie. They did. It didn't work. Mm. The, I uh, mean, oh, what was it called? It was a Martin Scorsese one with the. Um, it was on Netflix, and it had Steve, not Steve Buscemi, Joe Pesci in it, and it had all the classics in it. I think. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah. But it's a remake of a continuation of The Godfather, I guess. Basically. It's some, something like that. And it's three and a half hours long. <clears throat> I'm just looking up as well. In fact, while I'm looking this up, tell me, if because this is one of the questions for later on down the line. So obviously, you know, the writers are on strike, the actors are on strike. Do you think we're going to see John Cena or The Rock or Dave Bautista in WWE for a shot here or there now that their calendars have freed up massively? Well, I, we'll, we'll talk about this later. No, I might as well talk about it see, now. Well, I think Cena, I think you'll see him because he was on, what was he on, SummerSlam? What was he on? No, he was on the Money Recently. in the Bank thing where he turned up and said, we should have WrestleMania here in, in London kind of thing. He did that. But he was he wrestled Austin Theory in another pay-per-view before that. Mm, WrestleMania I think you this see, year. I, Okay. I think you'll see John Cena. Possibly you see The Rock. Batista, I don't know. The, the jury's out on him. I don't know if we'll see him or not. It's called The Irishman. But, was but now, here's the next idea I had. Since The Rock went with Amazon, I think you're going to see some kind of concerted uh, joint venture between Amazon and WWE mm -hmm. because The Rock is the connector. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you think WWE remember, is going to go into streaming? I, everybody else is. I don't know why they wouldn't. See, I still don't understand streaming. And people look at me and say, what's to understand? I don't get it. I mean, I get it, but I don't understand how it works. And you don't have to explain to me. I would just be ignorant for the mm -hmm. rest of my life. Uh, I was going to attempt an explanation then, but the thing is with streaming is you say, well, it's like TV, except it's on demand and you can pick whatever you want to watch whatever time for a nominal monthly fee, apart from the times when it is live and then it's just like television, except it comes through your internet instead of through a cable or, or an aerial. See, Facebook. that's complicated. That's complicated as hell. It took you 30 seconds to describe it. Mm -hmm. So I don't get it. <clears throat> Okay, sorry about that. Dutch was at a slight Dutch angle there, and Dutch is going to tell me off now. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't noticed by now, James is a bit of a perfectionist. So the camera angle could be off but this much. Oh, you need to tilt it here, tilt it there. But he can see it better than I can, so thanks for telling me. At least you did it in a nice, courteous, polite, English way. As I do everything. As I do everything. Right, <laughs> let's, get in, let's get in some news. <laughs> Right, you told me to talk about this, and I sort of just, it, it, maybe it just passed me by until I think I saw Booker T talk about it, and then everybody started talking about it. It's Kevin Nash on L.A. Knight being a ripoff of The Rock. Now, I've got some quotes for you. Bear with me. This was a couple of weeks ago. I think they were all on his podcast. Am I the only one that sees like an absolute ripoff of The Rock to the point when he cuts that promo on fudging Logan Paul or whatever the fudge his name is? I'm cleaning this up as we go along. The only thing he didn't do is turn the mother fudger sideways. Jesus Christ, does everybody have amnesia? There's nothing original. Then last week, Kevin Nash said the following. There's so many people who agree that LA is doing The Rock slash Austin. I mean, the guy's been in the business for like 10 years. Why didn't he get over anywhere else? If you're not over in three years, it's probably just not going to happen. I was like, okay, this is a rib, right? And then it's not. It's just what the character is. So I get hot and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? But they've fans on social media said I buried the guy I didn't say he couldn't work I've never seen him in the ring I just said it the character wasn't very original I'm not going to apologize I think it's a blatant ripoff but I didn't mean any harm sorry that was a long-winded way of doing it okay then so Kevin it. Nash on LA night what do you make of all that well <clears throat> they brought him out first and I may have already explained this so let's go over it again they brought him out first with those maximum male models I predicted dead on arrival which he was you couldn't get that gimmick over together in a month of sundays you just can't do it there was something missing in it 
uh, probably because of the effeminate nature of the two guys that he was managing. So after three weeks, he said, eh, they finally figured out, yeah, well, maybe Dutch is right. Let's send him on his own. And I think that L.A. Knight went to him. He said, guys, let me do my own stuff. It got over, and it did get over. I was with him in TNA. It got over. Good talker. Oh, yeah, let me talk at you. Let me talk at you. Let me talk to you. And now you can see him come out. I don't care if he's knocking off, I don't know, James the Fourth. I don't give a crap. As long as that audience re, uh, responds to him, he's getting over. I don't care because I did get uh, I did get Stone Cold vibes when he was coming to the ring. You know, I was Stone Cold would walk. He walks similar to the same way. I don't really see the Rock so much as I see Stone Cold. But as long as he gets over, who cares? How long has it been since Rock uh, uh, Stone Cold's been there? Twenty years. He retired from full time wrestling in two thousand and three. So yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Twenty years. And the Rock. When did when did he step away from it? Jeez, full time like two thousand and two, and and then he's come back here and there, of course, afterwards. Because they were so over, you could bring them back, and I mean, even the the old time fans remember them now the younger fans go back and look at some of their stuff and they get over all over again mm -hmm. so whether he is uh and uh, he really uh, kevin he really ripped la uh night but he had never really seen him <laughs> maybe one time and by his own admission that i don't know who the guy is well if you don't know <laughs> who somebody is, uh, kind of hold back your, your judgment on it before you can see him. And now, since he got so much backlash by the fans, now he's come out and said, okay, okay. And at least he said, okay, I was wrong. Maybe I looked at him and, yeah, he's got a, a great worker. I, I could have a good match with him which actually means that LA Knight could have a good match with him. That's what that means. Let's, <clears throat> let's turn that around. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think Kevin learned uh, the hard way when you, when you say something that the fans don't agree with, they'll call you on it because the fans, I don't give a crap what you call them. They still run this business and they have seen a, a lot of things because the fans shut down the maximum male models. The fans shut that down, and they should have because it was it was hitting on zero. Why waste TV time on something that doesn't have a rat's chance in hell of getting over? So, Kevin, all I can say is you finally <clears throat> you finally came to the right decision. Uh, La Knight is going to make a, make a big big difference, and uh, and bringing him back against the Rock, I think. Uh, would be a good idea. But, and I had one more thing to say is, uh, I don't know, well, I forgot. Well, why you think about that then? It's like, uh, LA Knight is a ripoff of The Rock or Steve Austin. It's like, well, who do you want him to rip off? Ken Raper? Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you, why hey. rip off the best if you're going to rip it off? You saw they were really successful. Why not? Why don't you rip off the monkey brother? <laughs> <laughs> Rip off those guys and the monkey brothers uh, fans. Let me say this. I had a guest today and James, when I started this with you, I didn't realize that I was going to be in kind of the, the arbiter of booking talent. Mm. They are the hardest pieces of what? granola. Oh, to book. And you'll say, well, you know, I might, you know, wait, wait a minute, let me see. You know, I, I've been wanting Ricky Morton on here for like, I don't know, six months. So I call him up. Hey, can you do it in two weeks? He goes, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be in Florida doing some NWA stuff. So I contact him the week after. He said he's going to be there for, for a week. I call him the next week. 
I'm still in Florida. Well, wait a minute. How long does it take to make a damn tape for the NWA? Come on, Ricky, help me out. I'm, they're just hard to hard to book. This week I had Barry Horowitz, and then you don't. You've interviewed Horowitz, haven't you? Oh yeah. Have you ever dealt with him? No, um, not in. I have. I have a middleman sometimes who, who oh, helps out. Who's very helpful. Me, with these things. me. Me, which I ain't, I'm not getting it done. But Barry, I love him to death. I gave him the the loser gimmick that they eventually took to WWF, and is a very very good gimmick. And I had him over with that loser gimmick in three weeks in Florida. I think it was 1985. I think it was a long time ago. But in every match, he'd go out there and he'd lose, and he'd lose. And I found one thing about wrestling fans. They're, they're sadist. Oh, they just, they want you to get me. And if, if, I mean, he, he lost every night and they were saying, get a job. You're a bum. You're the shit. <laughs> I came to him one day. I said, Barry, it was before TV. I said, Barry, listen, uh, we're going to have to change your gimmick. Why, man? Why? 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 I said, you know, we're going to have to put you over today. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no, don't let me win. No, it'd kill me. <laughs> and I was kidding him, and it would have killed him if he'd won a match with, without an angle. <clears throat> but you never told me that these guys are so hard to book and so hard to deal with. Oh, and I was, I, was a, I, was a, I was a booker, so I should have been used to it. But I said, ah, nah, people, because wrestlers have big egos, big, big egos, and nothing they like more than to talk about themselves in a positive way, of course, they're not going to talk negative about themselves. And I thought they would enjoy coming on a podcast with me so we could uh, shoot the crap. But oh no, they got to do this, they got to do that. And... Hey, welcome to my world. This is my, this is my working life. It's tough to get people oh, oh, on sometimes. Well, how hard am I to work with? you really easy. Oh, thank you very it, much. Because I just say, uh, I'll pay you this much beer at this time. You go, okay. <laughs> it's not you know i don't deliberate on it long it's yes or no <laughs> but oh, people yeah. ask me they said where did you where did you find james i said well james actually found me because he called me and wanted me to do his show then we started talking and it turned into this he said well but i do get a lot of comments on how the people enjoy the show and i'm i'm glad of that so if you got any friends folks or if you want to all the clips that James puts up during the week, share them with a friend and subscribe because we're trying to get to a hundred thousand uh, viewers. Uh, I mean, subscribers, and we almost got ninety right now, right? Yeah, we're in eighty-nine something or other. It, current ch trends will be there at some point early-ish next year, but I want it this year just yeah. because. Why not? Yeah, I told Kenny Bowling, I said we we was at eighty nine thousand, and we had you on the show, and he dropped to eighty three. <laughs> I said you'd lost us six thousand viewers, a subscriber, <laughs> and I'm kidding him though. But all right, so what was the question? Oh, I don't know. We're moving on now. Uh, right after we recorded our show last week, and it always happens. There's a bit of news, so we record this on a Thursday morning, uh, Eastern time. And then as soon as we hung up, some news came out, and it was AEW uh, revealing in a memo to its talent. Uh, I don't know if it's the first memo they've ever sent out with stuff you can do and can't do, but this is the first one that was made public anyway. And it is moves or actions that are banned outright, or moves or actions that will require agents to sign off on it beforehand. So I'll read you the banned list first. Unprotected shots to the head, shots to the back of the head, buckle bombs, blind moves, backwards into the turnbuckle fencing response or seizure cells spitting what's a what's a fencing response i was hoping you would tell me that i don't know what a fencing I, response. I, I, I read that i went i've never heard of it well, maybe unless it's like, it, on it's guard, like that that's fencing well, how how could that hurt somebody i don't know i, I well i mean it, it's teamed with seizure cells so i'm imagining it's trying not to well, look seizure like, cell i understand that that's yeah. like faking a seizure yeah, without it being there because, and that's that's a good rule because a guy could be having a seizure and he said, "I nah, he just playing." No, that was the old Terry Funk thing that he used to do when he was a lot older, and he'd just go like that, and it was like, 
<laughs> Dave, do you know who else did that? Devon Dudley used to do that all the time as well. Right, we'll move on. Blood in the crowd, i.e. no bleeding while in the crowd and no throwing bloody gear, tape or other objects into the crowd. Weapons or projectiles into the crowd, taking drinks or food from guests in the crowd. And one more of the band list, physical contact with the crowd, e.g. wrestler holding opponent, allowing fan to chop them. Well, I agree with the list. But their big problem was they were probably told that before they had a match. And the talent went, yeah, you don't know. I'm not listening to that. I'm going to do what I want to do. I am glad to see Tony Khan finally took charge of some of his talent and laid down the law to them. And what was going to happen was they were going to get a massive lawsuit, and they probably have some already that we, we just haven't heard about. But the, those are unnecessary suits because if they just use common sense, don't go out in the crowd because some guy out there could have a knife and he could be a little bit mentally deranged and stick you. I've seen a lot of back in years ago, you had to watch going in the crowd because everybody had a knife, probably had a gun because they didn't go through metal detectors. One time in, uh, I guess it was the Knoxville Territory, they were in Hazard, Kentucky. Think of that name, Hazard. It was a hazard to go there. That's the Dukes of Hazard, it, isn't it? Is that, isn't that where yeah, they that's were? About base, yeah, right. up, up, up there in those Appalachian Mountains. Something was going on, and one guy pulled out a gun, and he didn't shoot at the ring, but he shot up in the air. Bam. He had it. So what was what if he got mad enough and the wrestler got close to him and he just shot him? And I, I don't think I've ever heard of a wrestler getting shot at the matches, but I have heard of wrestlers getting shot outside the ring. There's one guy he was doing a Hell's Angel gimmick. Don Fargo was one of them. And one of the bikers came up to him. And I forgot the other guy's name that was doing it with him. They invited them to like a big party, like out in the woods a little bit. And he took them out there to set them up and they shot one of them. And I think Don got away. Hmm. Cause he took, took them out there and said, we don't appreciate you wearing our colors. And then they got into it. And then one of them got shot. They got away, but crazy stuff, man. And that stuff you don't hear. Is there anything written about that? Because Don Fargo told me the story. I'm... Handsome, ha Handsome Jimmy told me the story, too. They wanted to invite him out for a big party because they liked him. And he said, I ain't going nowhere with them bikers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to find the name of the other guy. It wasn't Ray Stevens. Don Fargo no. apparently wrestled as Ray Stevens' brother at some point. I'm just looking at forum. Um, anything on that list? We'll go back to the list. Anything on the list that you think, eh, well, you know, under the right circumstances, uh, you know, like uh, unprotected shots to the head. Like it depends on the weapon, I presume. Well, that's a that's a chair shot. That's why Mick Foley. He told me he he has trouble remembering things mm -hmm. because he got hit in the head, and he would tell the guys, "Lay it in." Lay it in. A guy told me one time, lay it in. So I put it in there, you know, where I felt comfortable with it. Harder, harder. And I hit him, just a touch harder. And he said, harder, harder. I said, that's as hard as I can hit. I'm not doing it because I, it, it's, it's crazy. Okay, do you remember the time that Mick Foley brought his wife and his child to to a match mm -hmm. and Royal, that's, Royal Rumble 1999 yeah I remember and, it well and that, he was against the rock mm -hmm. and he got handcuffed right mm -hmm. and he told the rock to hit him hard and i think they were right in front of his wife and little girl mm -hmm. the little girl was just screaming and the wife took the baby and left i don't blame her you know there's her daddy 
I mean, you got to be careful with that stuff. And I don't know if Mick told him it was contrived or what, but you can tell them that, oh, no, this is, this is not real. But when you hear that chair coming in and it's bouncing off someone's skull, you can say, oh, no, it's nothing. It's nothing. You're not hurting me. But you, it, it scares people. It scared the little girl. So, but I always, I always told my daughter, yeah, you know, it's, we're just playing, we're just playing. So, but anyway, you got to watch little kids, especially if you're in this business and because they don't know the difference and that could be very uh, traumatic and emotionally troubling for them later on. Do you know, it's funny you mentioned that because when he was handcuffed, this is Mick Foley. He's, uh, I yep. think he wrote this in one of his books. He said that he hadn't realized, even though he isn't blocking the chair with his hands, he didn't realize that having his arms forcibly behind his back would alter the entire way his body could absorb the hits. So it ended up just feeling 20 times worse than he was expecting. And when when he was going down from these chair shots, he, he wasn't trying to go down. He was basically just forced down because he just couldn't impact the blow, uh, absorb the blows as well as he thought he could. Well, what's that old saying? F A F O? No, F A F O. You know what that means, right? No. Fuck around, find out. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that is probably the best example I can <laughs> give you. Except he wasn't effing around. He was, you know, he he learned that the hard way. Let me uh, let me give you the banned unless signed off list prior uh, to the match. Spots and bumps on the ring apron and outside table ladder. Oh, chair good, spots. great! I saw uh, uh, the bumps on the apron. That is the hardest part of the ring. And the fans don't care, and, the, and oh, it they never leads get... to a finish. So what's the point? <laughs> they don't. They don't. They don't give a damn. But say you can do one hell of a move. And you could ruin your life. You could get paralyzed. You could get your back before you have half surgery. The fans will remember that uh, 15 seconds, maybe, or maybe a day. The person that takes it is going to remember it the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. So that's why working, working believably and, and telling a story comes in. Okay, this is let me let me give you an example. No, two guys, two guys have this one hell of a match on TV, and the booker says, "That's effing great, guys. I want you to do it again this week." They go out there the next week, have a hell of a match again, boom. And he said, "Let's do it the third time." By the third time, they have done everything they can do. Nothing is new. That's why you got to start telling the story. Because you can stack a story. You can't stack, you know, a big bump off the top rope on top of something else. They've seen it. That's why you have to have the sto story that touches them here. That you can sit back and say, logically, that's what you got to do. You got to, and what's happened to a lot of wrestling, the logic left. It's gone. It's, it is what it is. So I watch something that says, I don't know if they would slow it down, but it's not their fault because they have nobody really to teach them. Now you can take WWE now, for example, they're telling that story with the bloodline and you feel that story first time, mainly because it's family one, it's believable. It could happen. And Roman Reigns is just an asshole, a big old fashioned asshole. When's the last time you saw Roman Reigns get in a hurry? Are any of them get in a hurry? Not long. Because what was it, 40 they, minutes, yeah. 40 minutes it was that segment a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? The yep. trial of. And, and they were screaming in the back, oh, it's too long. Oh, we got a short. Tell them to go home. Tell them to go. They did. Over 3 million viewers, which is a, when's, well, we talked about this last week. When's the last time they got 3 million viewers? They would have to go back in their books 
I think you're a little fuzzy. Oh, am I, Mister? Hang on. It's, I've got oh, an no, auto. Sorry. I've got an auto focus thing for you. It's fine here. <laughs> don't worry. You carry on. There it is. Okay. But uh, and when Fox saw that, they said, "Oh no, forget it, forget it, forget it." Now I think they're trying to get some of these because WWE used to do that. They used to do those long segments, and the audience would build. It's like if something's something's going on and you channel surf over there. Oh, let, let me watch this a second, and you end up staying till the end of it. And it had a hell of a it had a payoff. As long as it has a payoff, you're okay. But and that's what I want to tell these young guys: try to tell a story. Now, sometimes, of course, you don't have three years to tell a match like the Bloodline does, but you can take a match. And in 15 minutes, 10 minutes, tell a decent story. I mean, it's going to be a small one, but you have to teach yourself to do that. Or take someone with prior knowledge of what it takes to build a story and go out there and do it. See, nobody taught me this business. I was on the job training and I would get in the cars at night uh, after the matches were over. I'd slide the driver's side and stop at the first 7-Eleven I saw or convenience store. And they'd, the veterans would go in there and get their beer. And then I'd come out and I'd wait about two beers in. I've told the story before, too. And uh, I would start talking to the veterans. Now, they liked me or I wouldn't have been in the car. And I said... What did they do wrong? <laughs> I said, what do you mean to say is what did you do right? You're the shit. Get to, you know, why don't you why don't you get a real job? Oh, they'd they'd rib me all the time. But then finally they would kind of start helping me because they kind of like me anyway. <clears throat> and I I've told it is slow down, do this, do this, and in this spot, think about this. And they they gave me things to think about which in the long run really uh, molded my wrestling style. And I had a bad habit when I started started out of just 90 miles an hour. I don't care. 90 miles an hour. I didn't sell nothing because my opponent didn't sell nothing either. But that's what they told me to s slow down and tell a story. The first time I really learned to tell the stories watching uh, – Dick Murdoch. I saw Dick Murdoch one night and I was in Charlotte. He took an arm drag. He sold it, I swear, for five minutes. And he grabbed his back. Oh, oh and the people were he was he was great. I even enjoyed it. He was outside the ring and oh, oh my back is tilling me in. He tried to get in the ring and oh. You'd, you'd had to, it was a thing of beauty, and I watched it, and the crowd was going nuts. Another guy who could do that, Don Fargo. The first time I went on our Broadway, and now Broadway, you may be, you know what that term means, right? Time limit draw. Yes. First time I went on our Broadway, it was with Don Fargo, and I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do <clears throat> with Don Fargo for an hour? And Don Fargo, he probably thought the same thing. What am I going to do? I got in there with Fargo for the first 20 minutes or 15 minutes. I didn't even touch him. It was all crowd. He had a little steam on him. I had some steam on me. <clears throat> he played with the crowd, and I let him play with the crowd. I said, and because they were, they were up enjoying it. And then we went through and had a hell of a match. And I was, I think I was, it was, I was 26 at the time. And, you know, to be asked to go an hour Broadway that early in my career meant the booker uh, had faith in me and Don to do it. And when you go an hour Broadway, you don't have to beat anybody. You don't have to have a screw finish. You don't have to have nothing. You just go through. And the people, when we finished, they were up. I remember one night I was in Nashville I worked with Randy Savage, and Savage and I, we didn't go five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. We'd go 30. We'd go 40, 45. And I went out, and we had this one hell of a match, and I always remember those Nashville fans were 
very excitable, loud, especially in a smaller building. And we probably had about 800 there. It seat about a thousand. We had a, it wasn't a sellout, but it was pretty full. And I went out of the ring and a guy stood up and he had overalls on, I think. And he had a little bit of a beer and he said, a hell of a match Dutch here. Here's your tip. I thought it was a, like a $5 bill. Maybe a 10, maybe a 10 back then is worth like, I don't know, at least 30, 40 now. He gave me a hundred dollar bill and I went to the back and looked at it. I never had a, I've seen hundred dollar bills, but I never saw a hundred dollar bill that belonged to me. And it was a hundred dollar bill. And I got it changed into regular money the next day. <laughs> I mean, smaller denomination, <laughs> excuse me, smaller denomination. <clears throat> and I gave Savage $50 of it the next day. Wow, man. <laughs> Oh, he was happy as hell. So, but, but he was half the match and he was half of what it took to have a successful match. So I shared it with him. I didn't have to, I didn't even have to tell him, but I did. So when fans enjoy matches after they buy a ticket, then give you a tip. And I was thinking later, why did that guy do that? This is what I think. I think he had a bet on it <laughs> and he won the bet and he gave me part of the bet. So <laughs> People in Nashville, they'll they'll bet on they'll bet on anything. <laughs> Man, well, you still bet on wrestling these days. Uh, anyway, uh, just for sake of completion, I'm going to rush through this list and we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, this is banned unless signed off prior by agent. So we've said spots and bumps on the ring apron, and then we go to table, ladder, chair spots in and out of the ring, any elevated spots outside of the barricades, all pile driver and tombstone variations, high risk dives on all the top rope moves like 450s, 630s, double moon salts with many flips. Intentional bleeding of any sort, not just blading. Uh, how do you... Yeah, oh yeah, so it'd be hard, way, wouldn't it? Throwing people into or over the ring steps, which read, is... Wait a minute, read that again. Intentional bleeding. Intentional bleed. Uh, where was it? Intentional bleeding of any sort, not just blading. So I imagine hard way as well is what they're getting at there. Well, who, who went a hard way? I don't know. But someone must have done it at some point, and that's why they put it but in. But how do you... Well, how do you know that's intentional... The guy could say it was a potato. Well, that's the artistry of it, isn't it? Some people want to get a hard way and some people are better concealing it than others. Well, one thing is they don't want blood if they have blood later. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Yep. Then you get the same thing. But I have railed and bitched and moaned for, for months and months and months. Some of these spots is going to get somebody killed. Mm-hmm are going to get somebody paralyzed for life, get their neck broken, their back broken. And apparently, and I said this earlier, Tony, Tony Khan, I'm glad he finally took charge of his own co uh, company and says, hey, you guys, you can't do this anymore. Well, he must have been getting a lot of, like, you know, from our podcast and from every other podcast out there, I'm sure, has pretty much been saying the same thing. You know, you need to lay the law down and... And, um, you know, it's not an independent wrestling federation where if someone hurts themselves, they book their own match and it's their problem, essentially. You know, th this is the company's problem if somebody hurts themselves or does something questionable or does something that they don't want kids to imitate, like a seizure cell or uh, choking, strangling with hands I wonder, or a weapon. I wonder, did, thing. I wonder, did Tony make anybody sign anything? I bet he did. Mm-hmm. It's not legal unless he did, unless they've been notified and you sign this paper that you've been notified. Well, it may well be that uh, they've already got pre-existing contracts and maybe in the contract it says if you go against the officer's wishes in any way, then you're liable for punishment or termination. And so if they send this memo out and it's official, uh, maybe they don't have to get any of the uh, performers to actually sign it, but now it's official, this is an edict from the top of the company. If they then go against it, then they're liable to be uh, fined or fired or something like that. I think that also means if they go out in the crowd and they hit somebody, <clears throat> since they've said we we won't go out in the crowd and mm. they do, then it's on them. It absolves the company themselves from liability. I got sued one time 
in Birmingham, Alabama, by this guy who jumped in the ring from something I forgot. I never touched him. The heels beat the crap out of him and threw him out. But when the suit came down, the two heels got sued. My partner got sued, and I got sued. And then they got in such a hurry to file the lawsuit, the guy, the lawyer, added the, the plaintiff's name <laughs> into the one. He sued himself, really. <laughs> he sued all four wrestlers, and his name, and his name was down there. He sued himself. That didn't, that didn't go very far. Uh, a couple more things, and we'll move on. Injury spots or angles, any physicality in the crowd or crowd brawling. So you can actually brawl in the crowd, or if you get it signed off, or any physicality involving referees, managers, extras, celebrities, or special guests. We are going to move on, and I wanted to show you a video. You've already seen it, but we're actually going to put it up in a minute. And I don't know how many of the... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, script's bad here. Triple A's Triple Mania event this past week. Callis, who was managing Vikingo. This is Don Callis uh, against Kenny Omega in the main event. Was jumped from behind by an off-duty security guard who apparently didn't know who Callis was. So Callis suffered a burst eardrum, minor ankle and neck injuries, and a ripped his nice suit as well. Pause him for a second we'll watch the video. Okay, we're back. You can't really see much on this video, but Dutch talk us through it for the audio listeners. Get up! Get up! Okay, there's there's Don Callis and Omega. This Help is... me out here. Who's who's Omega got Omega down? Uh hang on. The uh I think Omega is down. We can't really see it on the screen, but right in oh. the top left corner, security then gets Don Callis into a headlock. There we go. You can... uh, up, uh, up in the top left-hand corner. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's not the best video to show people, but um, how the hell do I get off this? There we go. Oh, I'll tell you, technology and me, Dutch. I'm telling you. So, uh, Well, I, I, I read a different story. I read that he was a part-time cameraman, too, or he had a camera. Okay. Is that true or no? I don't know. Read that? I don't know if he was just there as a fan or not. The version I heard was that he was off... <clears throat> He was security, and he'd done security, and he was, you know, he knew people who were doing security that night. But he wasn't working that night, and either he thought Don Callis was a fan, or whatever it was, or he just got caught up in the moment. But he ended up putting Callis in a chokehold, and as I say, bursting an eardrum, minor ankle and neck injuries, and ripping now, his suit. And this happened in Mexico. Yes, a few days ago. And, and that hurt. Don Callis got hurt. Mm. He flew to San Diego. I read for medical advice. Don't go back to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, d yeah, don't go and get out on the field around a bunch of fans. But anyway, it shouldn't have happened, but it is, unfortunately, one of the things in this business that we have to put up with. And his security wasn't very secure. And I heard he had uh, Callus down, and Callus was immobilized. He couldn't go anywhere. He probably had that rear naked choke. I don't know what he had on him. <clears throat> but apparently he had it uh, enough on him that they had to pull him off. So, Don, I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad you could get up and walk away. But again, it was a bad situation. Not necessarily Don's fault. Don was out there because he had to be with, with his guy and a fan. Uh, snatched him and Don Callis probably he had some heat on him since he turned on Omega he does have some heat on so this should serve as a warning that some of these people take this shit seriously you know we can go out there oh let's have a hell of a match and let's do this no no you don't let's don't do that please <laughs> because I've said it time and time again you have to feel the heat in the room. Now, he didn't have a room there, and he probably had no reason to believe that this would go this far. But inside a building, you can hear them. And they have a, they have a thing called if the people get too hot. They call it white heat. And they almost quieten down. Mm -hmm. That's when you have to really, really be on alert because now they're thinking you got to think of the crowd as one 
you know, complete brain. If they get quiet, you don't know what they're thinking. And all of a sudden, when they go, they'll probably all go. White Heat was described to me by one of the assassins, Tom Renesto, years ago. He says, when they get quiet, watch out. Get out of the ring as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I've only heard that like, I've heard it a couple of times. <clears throat> heard it a couple of times in Puerto Rico. And one time in Louisville, Kentucky, I heard it. As we beat up this real young Indian kid, like his yeah. daddy was an Indian, I've told that. Yeah, yeah. We beat the crap of him before they got hot. And we had a hell of a time getting back. Women were attacking us. I mean, not just men, women were attacking us. So, but we got to the back. But anyway, Don, I'm glad you got out of it. I hope you're okay. And sometimes, what's that saying? F A F O. F -O yeah. And that's the second time I've said it today, and that's how you find out. Next on the agenda, Eric Young. He requested his release from WWE a few months ago, has returned to Impact Wrestling. Eric later tweeted, I made a hard choice, and there is no doubt in my mind it was the right one. Now, this is a writer up from Cultaholic. A report suggests that Paul Heyman pitched for Young and Mike Bennett to be part of the new Wyatt family in 2020. With Eric Young again pitched to work alongside Bray Wyatt, Bo Dallas and Uncle, uh, as Uncle Howdy and Alexa Bliss in 2023. Creative plans were reportedly set in January and would have kicked into gear after WrestleMania this year. But Wyatt's forced absence due to an undisclosed illness or whatever reason he's away put a halt to plans whilst Bliss has temporarily exited WWE on maternity leave. Eric Young, as part of Bray Wyatt's newest family, can you see that happen? He can grow a good beard. I'll give Eric that. Oh, he's great. I think putting Eric Young, I think Eric Young's personality precedes him. I think covering him up inside a group is like the worst thing they could do to him. Because he stands out on his own. He's kind of quirky. And I think the people would like that. Who is the guy that doesn't talk? Dexter Loomis? Yeah. Is that him? Mm -hmm. I think they would be more of a combination. Eric Young and Dexter Loomis. Or <laughs> I would think that Eric Young would try to explain everything he doesn't say. It'd be... It'd be if you had a good writer for that, that would really be really be entertaining stuff to get him up. But I think to take Eric, uh, and I, he didn't go in 2020, he said, because of he was in NXT in 2020, right? Yeah, I think he was there from like 2016 to 2020, but he was mostly either on NXT or when he went up to the main roster, he was kept on main event and he just lost. He just WWE just never, ever used Eric to his full potential at all. Well, apparently Vince didn't much like him. He's not he's not that tall. He's probably five nine, maybe. But his personality and his character, very, very entertaining. We had him in TNA and he was over. Because he would you'd look at him, he'd go, What? What? He was always like somebody was behind him and he was all and you if you're around somebody like that, you're saying, Oh, what are you looking at? What, what's going on with you? It was never explained, but it didn't have to be explained. That was the way he was. He was scared of everything. But uh, but I, I think putting him and covering him up with Bray Wyatt in 2020, you said, I think that was a, not the best move. And probably Eric probably made the right move. If they're going to do that, you know, they're not going to let the Eric Young character – get over. So I, so I don't blame him. So, but he also didn't trust Vince, did he? Apparently he requested his release around WrestleMania time. And he cited Vince McMahon's return to the company a couple of months earlier as the reason why he wanted to go. So I don't know if he was just like kept on the sidelines while Bray Wyatt was doing whatever he was doing. And then when Bray Wyatt left, that left Eric Young with nothing to do. And with nothing to do and Vince McMahon back in charge, who apparently Eric thinks Vince thinks nothing of him. And maybe in four years in WWE when he did nothing but lose or stay in NXT, mm -hmm. he's probably right. Well, you 
usually can look around and if they've done nothing with you, they've not even intimated that they're going to do anything with you. Okay. They're telling you, we're not going to do anything with you. So go and do something else. And he did. I'm glad he did. One last piece of news. After a brief run with Impact Wrestling, Nick Aldis announced he was leaving the promotion. Rumors have circulated uh, that Aldis will be heading to WWE, but not in a wrestling capacity. Uh, Aldis would actually be an agent. That's what the rumors are at the moment. And there's also been rumors for years why WWE has never been interested in Nick Aldis as a wrestling talent when Aldis has only really vaguely said uh, backstage politics. And that's why he was never in WWE. That's the only thing I think he's ever really said publicly. Why do you think WWE has never shown an interest with Nick? Because, I mean, from the face of it, you think he's a good talker, he's got a great body on him, he's got a good look, he's a good wrestler. What's not there for WWE to get behind? Well, you would have to ask them. I don't know, but I thought I thought he would be the perfect choice for WWE. <clears throat> If these rioters are so good, give him something. I mean, you got to ask them what they want him to do. But he was big enough. He was tall enough. Like you said, he was good looking enough, talented enough. Plus, I, I, I think he was also British. And the British, I don't know if you can, it's the British accent. You can't trust him. <laughs> Those little Tory bastards, you got to watch them. Uh, but I don't, I don't know why. But I think put, making him an agent is a good job, pays pretty well. But still, he's not going to be on the active roster. He's not going to make wrestler money. So uh, I think that's kind of a a downgrade for his talent. I'll I'll just leave it at that. How much did you work with him over the years? Was he in TNA while you were still in TNA the first run? Yeah, yeah. I worked with him quite a bit. He had good ideas, easy to work with. I mean, if you want him to do something, he doesn't want to do it. He would, you know, politically bring it to your attention, and he would do it. Uh, what do you think about this? See, he didn't necessarily have to say, like, I don't think this is good, but what do you think about this? He would bring it to you in a diplomatic type way. Mm -hmm. And you think about it. And if it's good, yeah, I've, I've made several concessions to him. Okay, do it that way. Because if he wants to do it that way and it doesn't really change the outcome, let him do it. Because he, he feels more uh, uh, passionate about doing it the way that he described it to me than the way I described it to him. Because he's going to have to put it in his his voice anyway. He's going to have to put his tone on it, his stamp on it. So if you're comfortable doing it that way, do it that way. It's not going to change anything. But I liked him, and I think, uh, I hope he's successful as, as an agent. But a lot of those agents they have in WWE, I don't think they know what they're doing. That's why they, and if you take an agent who doesn't know what he's doing so much, with young talent who don't know what they're doing, there's no telling what you come up with. See, I don't, I don't know how some agents, when I was there, kept a job. To tell you the truth, they didn't do nothing. Most of the agents when I was there, they would just come to you and say, "You're on third, like twelve minutes, thirteen, fourteen minutes," and whoever's over then they'd leave and who did they leave to work the match up their participants now that's their job i got that but most of the agents wouldn't sit and listen to what the uh, the active wrestlers had in mind so if something come up in that match that vince didn't like everybody got cussed out everybody and the agent especially because he should have known this was coming, and he didn't. So I think one of the, the, the agent's job is like uh, undefined, or it was. It was undefined in WWE other than delivering the, delivering the news. They didn't try to help you through anything, and they didn't have any ideas anyway. 
It basically comes down to talent. And it, and I've heard this is what AEW agents do. They just take guys uh, what, what they wanted in a match, and they disagree with it. So, but it was Tony Khan's idea. So if you don't like it, go to Tony Khan. Because I'm just delivering the news, guys, and they would tell you that. I'm I'm just delivering the I'm just delivering the mail. So if you don't like it, go see go see the po- postmaster general. He's sitting right up there. <laughs> but anytime you tell the talent to go see the head guy, guess what? They don't go. Mm-hmm. It, they would they don't want to be shut down, told to shut up, do what they're told, or they could go home. That's the last thing you want to hear. But anyway, I work with uh, back to Mr. Aldis, great guy, and I hope he's successful. But I think we'll see him in the ring. I'd suggest so. How old is well. he? How old, um, is, how old is he? Maybe about 40, somewhere around there. L.A. Knights well, L- L.A. Knights. See, a long time, WWE had this, uh, this uh I'm wrong. Of a, 36. A He's the same age as me, in fact. There you go. Okay. Well, a long time, WWE had this uh, rule, I guess. They didn't want to hire anybody over 30. I'm going to tell everybody that's listening out there, when you see a great wrestler, he didn't learn this business overnight. He learned it, and he probably started learning it and putting it together at around age 30. Oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. Now his body is telling him, slow the F down, slow down and sell it. Now they learn. (laughs) Now they learn the art of selling that Dick Murdoch. I just talked about him Mm -hmm. that he learned a long time ago. You sell it and you get more mileage out of it. And if the people are enjoying it, you're doing your job. But I think that's when wrestlers kind of learn how to start putting it together. Even watching Brian Danielson, he slows it down where he needs to slow it down, and he works a hold. And if the fans are kind of invested in it, they're going to buy the they're going to buy the selling because that's what your body is doing. You're telling them that you're in trouble. You're it hurts a little bit, and how do you get out of it? This is not the easiest business to learn. Now, somebody asked me one time, I'm, I meant to say this a long time ago. What's it take to be a booker? Well, hell, anybody could be a booker. You could be a booker. Anybody listening could be a booker. Just say, do this and do this. Then you're a booker. But being a successful, successful booker, you know, it takes knowledge and it takes patience. And I preach patience all the time. You've got to have patience. Now, the best example of patience that people have seen in recent years is the Roman Reigns experiment. Took their time with him and stayed with him. They didn't need jerk when he didn't have the crowd all standing up. And at the, at the beginning, I had my doubts too. Because he was a stone cold baby face. They didn't want to see him being a heel. But now that they see him being a heel, he could be a baby face overnight, but you've got to have a hot heel. Because you don't have a hot heel, uh, you, you turn him for nothing. And the only uh, one I would like to see and I think would draw money would be Roman Reigns against Randy Orton. Mm. That's something new. Then you got those Randy Orton, he, when they called him the Viper, that was a great name for him. Because he has no he has no moral views on anything, especially in the ring. And he would be a great opponent for Roman Reigns. So, but I'm a, I'm off the point here now. Mm-hmm. But what were we talking about? Well, uh, my dementia is kicking in. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go off the news now and we're going to talk about... There's one bit of news which isn't news, but I'm going to tell you about it off air. But we are going to now relive, <clears throat> not really by watching much of it, but because uh, I watched a bit of it this morning, uh, quite a, a lot of it actually. It's terrible. Heroes of Wrestling. <laughs> now, oh, my God. It's just... Uh, 
let me right. I'm, I'm I've got a bit of preamble for you, and I've got a little fact that you don't know uh, that I've sort of keyed you uh, teed you up with beforehand. Held on October tenth, nineteen ninety nine, at Casino Magic in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, Heroes of Wrestling, a nostalgia themed wrestling event featuring stars some ten to twenty years beyond their prime, with a couple of exceptions, is infamous for foisting off onto the twenty nine thousand pay per view buyers. Apparently, forty thousand was the break even point, and two thousand three hundred fans, and by fans, probably mostly just people they corralled out of the casino for free because it was heavily papered event as well. Live in attendance, quite possibly the worst professional wrestling event in the medium's history. Heroes of Wrestling was dis- a disaster from the off, including a deeply inebriated Jake the Snake Roberts, the worst match in recorded history, horrendous production values top to bottom, and some other stuff that was also just crap. Uh, first off, Dutch, you have been described as possibly the only... Why, co- why, don't you, why don't you tell me you hated this pay-per-view without telling me you hate... <laughs> Oh, I can, you I can tell you if you like. Oh, it's awful, uh, man. Uh, go ahead. Do you know? Actually, you uh, you actually inspired me, and we'll get to why in a bit. Inspired me to think of this as this week's topic. Um, before, and I'll tell you when that comes up. But first off, you've been described as possibly the only good thing on that pay per view. For people who don't know, Dutch was doing the color commentary that night. And before we get into the event itself, do you remember who came up to you with the concept of the event? Uh, your fee for the evening, what and who you were promised uh, would be working uh, commentary with you and who would be working in the ring that didn't happen and who would be appearing in the the event that eventually pulled out. I forgot who called me about it. Some guy. That <laughs> he was connected with the event. <clears throat> but they were looking for a color commentator. And I never, I was going to be working with Gordon Soley. So I said, okay. And then they wanted to know, this is how you get booked in wrestling like anything else. What do you, what do you want in terms of compensation? And I didn't know they had all this trouble before I said, I forgot what it was. It was either 2000 or 2,500. Cause I would be out there the entire show. Well, they said, okay, I think I got that. I think I got, I don't know. I've got something like that. But at the last minute, Gordon Soley had a medical emergency, and he couldn't come. Or a premonition. All right. <laughs> Maybe he said later, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I got sick. I missed that. But he didn't show up. And they put this other announcer with me called, and I still remember his name, Randy Blooming Stone or Bloomingdale? Rosenbloom. Or... Rosenbloom. R- Randy Rosenbloom. Randy Rosenbloom. And I had no idea he didn't know anything about wrestling. He didn't tell me. I'm assuming that he is the lead announcer on a professional wrestling pay-per-view. So therefore, what qualifies him to do this job and and I didn't question him. He had the talk. I mean, he didn't say. He had the suit. Huh? He had something. <laughs> and we went out there, and it didn't take me long before I realized this guy don't know jack shit about anything. That's probably why the commentary, somebody said it was good. Hell, a babbling baby would have been good at against this guy because he knew nothing. He, I don't know what he called a slam. What did he call that? He oh, called I've, something. I've got a couple of examples for you. So Randy Rosenblum was who he ended up commentating with instead of Gordon Soley, an LA sports commentator who knew so little about wrestling. He referred to a drop kick as a flying leg kick and an arm drag <laughs> as a reverse slam takedown. And I haven't written this, but I saw this as well. He also called a snake eyes, you know, the thing over the ropes, uh, a body slam. Well, he, he knew nothing. And so I just got to talking and I was hoping maybe people can go deaf <laughs> when he's talking so they wouldn't hear what he was saying. <clears throat> but I will say that this pay-per-view was so bad. You ever hear something that's so bad, it actually kind of good. And it is so bad. Now it's now taken on a status of its own. Because it's like a cult classic. It is that bad. 
Plan Nine and from Outer Space, the wrestling version. It's like the it's like Ed Wood directed it. Oh. <laughs> Ed Wood, who was was he the director? Uh, you know who I mean, don't hey, you? He's like the director no, I, of the I'm, worst films of all time. I've seen the film as well with uh, George Steele, in fact, and Bill uh, uh, Bill Murray's in it, and um, Johnny Depp plays Ed Wood. Ed Wood was the director. Edward was the awful director of the worst films of all time. I read a story about him one time. He would go to get financing for his next movie, and they'd always say, your last movie was horrible. And he said, yes, but the next one will be better. Mm -hmm. He was the ultimate optimist. <clears throat> and his, his Ed Wood, I saw the movie. I thought it was great. That's a cult classic, too. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance to see Ed Wood, uh it's, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but if you get it, you get it. But this, this, uh, this, I didn't know. Before the guys went out to the ring, I never went back to the dressing room and met them. I just went to the desk. I spent most of my time around the desk. And Rose and Bloom, he didn't show up to about. 30 minutes before the show started, I think. And I introduced myself and sat down and we had the cameraman in front of us and, and not a, nobody even really talked to me about anything. It was produced badly. I don't know who produced it, but I never met the producer. I never met the truck. I never met the director. I never met the, uh, the cameraman other than the one right in front of me. And it was just to fly by your uh, your seat pants all the way through it, and when you see it, you'll see what I exactly what I'm talking about. Even the work, the wrestling, the wrestlers were horrible because they had no direction either. Uh, I, there's a couple of things I want to get to with the commentary as well. Uh, I think Rose and Bloom's uselessness started rubbing off on you slightly with your commentary because at the end of the first match. Instead of saying you don't have to be a brain surgeon to da da da, da you say uh, you don't have to be a brain-sized scientist, and then you just sort of just trail off and then just move on. But it's just, uh, it's just. Well, well, I I don't remember saying that, but <laughs> it was funny. And and I could have said I think I was going to say brain scientist. Yes. I think that's what I was going to say. And um, this is the bit I blacked out for you, so you don't know who it is. Do you know? who was going to be the original colour commentator for the event. Not Gordon Soley, he would have been play-by-play. -play, the original colour commentator. No. Who? Ted DiBiase. Oh. But wouldn't you know, he had, uh, maybe I don't know, maybe Jesus told him not to turn up and uh, in, a, in a prayer. Okay, God is going to come down and strike you for saying well, that. Well, the funny thing... I want you to know that. The irony is is that this event was held in Mississippi, and, you know, yep. Ted loves hanging about in Mississippi these days, but anyway, he didn't turn up for this one. What's the latest in that case? Nothing new, sadly. Uh, I, I'm almost living for information on, on, on the Ted DiBiase case. I love it. Uh, we're going to move on now. So more wrestlers who were originally booked to appear but then pulled out. Sid Vicious was approached in May and agreed, and then pulled out in June after signing with WCW. Vader, Terry Funk, Bam Bam Bigelow, Honky Tonk Man all refused to appear. Nick Bockwinkle was advertised but didn't appear on the show. Maybe he was going to be the commissioner, I don't know. Reckless Youth, there's a name uh, a few of you might recognise. He was like an indie darling for a brief period in the late 90s. Uh, he was going to wrestle two called Scorpio, but then he signed a WWF development deal and was replaced by Julio Fantastico, who some may remember as Julio De Niro of late ECW Infamy. Not Infamy, Notoriety. Infamy's bad. Uh, then there are matches which were all various shades of awful with almost every performer looking to have aged 40 years in the span of five <laughs> since last being on TV. Greg Va Bless him, Greg Valentine. But, I mean, he uh, yeah, uh, he was one of them. Uh, First off, the Samoan... Uh, shall I just run through the matches, see if you remember any Go of ahead. them? Samoan SWAT team, uh, Samu and the Samoan Savage uh, defeats the lesser... Uh, not the lesser halves of their respective tag team, so I don't know if Tommy Rogers was, but Marty Giannetti and Tommy Rogers, like the other guys in the more famous tag teams who were with. Uh, SWAT team were very fat and out of shape, despite being in their mid-30s at the time. Uh, 
Uh, uh, but Marty looked good, and so did Tommy Rogers. Greg Valentine defeats George the Animal Steel, who before the match is accompanied by Sherry Martell. And why? Why do, what? Do, do you, why was Sherry Martell out with George the Animal Steel only to go to only to turn heel halfway through and then like side with Greg Valentine, who I'm not sure she has any relation, on-screen relationship with either of them. I don't have any idea why any of this stuff happened. I really don't. I, uh, I'm looking at it and saying, what are they doing? Cause it had no rhyme, no reason. Nobody talked to me about anything that I listen. I watched it. I was doing color commentary. I watched it <laughs> like I was at the, in a ringside seat, like I'd bought a ticket. And if you were sitting next to me, I was giving commentary to you while it was going on. I didn't know. I didn't even know who was going, going over. I didn't know who was going to win. I was just winging it. So whatever that turned into, that was a off the cuff presentation. And I did it the best I could. Because a lot of it was truly, truly embarrassing. It really was. The Sherry thing. I think you and Randy Rosenblum just sort of go, oh, Sherry's now attacking George uh, George the Animal Steel. Oh, isn't that something? <laughs> there, was just, there was like, because how could there be? There was like no emotion in it because you were just as confused. As, there was no motivation for any of this. Uh, forget about Heroes of Wrestling for a minute. Sherry Martel, you knew her when she was very young in the business, didn't you? And, uh, oh, yeah. I think it was Jim Cornette who managed her first, and then it was you second or something like that in Memphis. I managed her first. No, she managed me first. Oh, she managed you first? Yes. And then Cornette managed me. <clears throat> Both of them very short-lived. Because I was the type who I didn't really... I didn't really need a manager, nor did I want a manager. And uh, and I don't know how – there's something online that when I ended up firing Cornette, which was pretty good when I fired him, and because I needed to let him go so he could go. And he, and he was – this was probably his first couple of weeks in the business. He still had a look about him that you wanted to slap – I mean, he just looked <laughs> like he just wanted to beat the crap out of him. The fans did. And they tried to a lot of times. He finally wised up and got him a tennis racket. And he has whacked some people with that tennis racket. He hit me one night with it and doing an angle. And I went, my God, do I owe you money or what? He hit me, I mean, hard. Now, it was flat. But can you imagine him taking that and turning it sideways and hitting somebody with the edge of it? He would open them right up. But that became his weapon of defense, and he used it quite often in the Charlotte Territory and Smoky Mountain. I'll uh, I'll bring up Sherry again in a minute. I want to ask about this. Uh, is it true that Jimmy uh, sometimes had a horseshoe in the tennis racket? I've heard that, but I don't remember that. Because I, I, we were in different kind of departments mm. at the time. Smoky Mountain, he was, he was the he ran it. He was the booker. He ran it, and he had ownership of it. Now he may have put a a, a horseshoe in it in Mid Atlantic, because those people were all over him. They hated him. Him and the Midnight Express. They drew a lot of money against the. Uh, it's the Rock and Roll Express. I don't understand why. Like, I, I suppose I do because you want to keep it, keep the weapon vital, you know, usable against fans. But I mean, he could have like padded that thing out if he was just going to use it on the wrestlers, surely. Well, I don't remember him putting a horseshoe in it with the wrestlers at all. Because hmm. he would have, he would have opened somebody up. Then there would have been a really big problem. Give me a story about Sherry Martel then. Where did she come from initially then? Was Memphis her debut in the business? Sherry Martel, I met her. She came to Memphis as a girl wrestler. And we weren't, none of us at that time, the territory wasn't really going that strong. 
so we weren't making that much money. But they don't pay managers money anyway. And I remember she actually broke her leg. And she worked a week on a leg that was later uh, designated as broken because she couldn't afford to miss work. Tom Pritchard is another, and he broke his ankle and worked two weeks on it before he had it diagnosed. So, and I, I think Sherry was either a former stripper or she worked in a, a lounge somewhere. And I think she was from, I, I may have all this wrong. I don't know exactly where she was from. I'm assuming down south by listening to her talk. But I will say one thing about Sherry. She was one tough female. I mean, she would take slams. She would take, you know, choke slams, everything that you wanted to give her. And she wouldn't bitch. She wouldn't moan. She'd go to the back and, and keep going. Now, when did she pass away? Oh, like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, maybe. It was. It was quite soon after a WWE Hall of Fame induction. Yeah, I liked her, and uh, there was a story that I, I can't remember exactly how it was. She went. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to look this up before I know what I'm. I, I'll save it for a later edition of this, but. It's a really good story about Sherry Martell. Okay, I'll write it into the notes. It was 2007 she uh, passed away. Uh, Next match is Tuchel Scorpio, who comes to the ring holding a WCW world title belt for some reason. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't have referred to it because you would have been like, well, why is he holding the belt? Uh, Defeats Julio Fantasco in a match full of uh, fairly blown spots. Um, including, I do want to make mention of this, uh, Scorpio's finish was the tumbleweed off the top, which is essentially like a tumbling leg drop off the top kind of thing. And he really obviously misses it. So what's the best thing you do? Show a replay of it from a different angle of him missing it. <laughs> like he's like two feet away. But, but so uh, you could t- in this pay per view, you can tell that the crew, the camera crew, that they're not educated in how to shoot wrestling. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to shoot it. Nobody told them. Nobody told me what to say or. I don't even know who wrote this pay-per-view. I had no, this was the pay-per-view nobody wants to take ownership of. Nobody said, oh, I wrote the Heroes of Wrestling pay You don't ever hear that. You don't hear anybody, oh, uh, a wrestler saying, I appeared on the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view. You don't hear that either. You don't hear me going around, oh, I did, <laughs> I did commentary on the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view. The worst pay-per-view ever done. I, I really believe that. And if you can, you can you get it online? Can you just watch it on YouTube? Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, the copyright holder has made it free for all, so anyone can upload uh, here as a wrestling or, or or upload matches. And uh, just just some picking up on something you said before. <clears throat> now, if you thought Randy Rosenblum was bad, what about uh, the person who joins commentary with you for this match? Captain Lou Albano, who is, I don't know what, I don't know if he won a raffle because like he ended up being the commissioner for the evening. I think he was just told at ringside and he flips out over it. But I mean, working with Captain Lou Albano and just like the effluvia of words, the rapid fire machine gun pace of, oh my God, and he kept calling it Julio for Julio that I wrote down here as well. Captain Lou Albano memories, for God's sake. He's Wait a minute! Before, before before we leave this, oh, yeah. what, what did you call his flow of words? The effluvia, the effluvia, the the sort of spillage of words flying out of his mouth, almost I like have never, unchecked. I have never, I have never heard that word before. Effluvia. I'm going to look it up. Not now, but I, I will later. <clears throat> oh, okay. I, I'm I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, through my headphones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lou, Lou Albano's coming out, and he's gonna he's gonna sit with you guys. I'm going okay. Me, I'm thinking they told him what they wanted him to say. They didn't tell him nothing. They said just go out there and start talking, and he did. And I don't know when he breathed. 
tell you the truth. And but he was sitting, I think, between us, I think, much as I remember. Mm-hmm. And I so I just I, I just let him do his thing. I mean, it's not up to me to direct traffic. I was trying to direct, I was trying to drive myself. I can't tell him how to drive. And then Randy too. So we we were all flying blind. If we was in a plane, we'd be going in all kinds of different directions, probably crashing it, but we didn't crash it yet, so it's still flying. With Captain Lou, did you meet him in the WWF? Was he still there at the time? Oh, I met him before, but I met him in my first run. Yeah. Probably 10 years earlier, probably, I met him. But he wasn't working there. He just came through one night. So, which led me to think, when those guys finished up with Vince, and he was with Vince Sr., I wonder, did Vince Jr. kind of help them out a little bit or not? Did he give them anything? Well, uh, I can tell you this. There were certain people that I think Vince Sr., before he died, told Vince Jr., look after certain people, like, you know, Gorilla Monsoon and Captain Lou, because he kept Captain Lou around for a while. Uh, Maybe Freddie Blassie, some guys like that, you know, just keep these guys around, give them a payday. And I think mm-hmm. Captain Lee was one of those. And also Captain Lee would come through very occasionally in the WWF in the 90s. I think he did, you know, uh, color commentary one evening on Raw, and that didn't happen again. Um, <laughs> and then I think, he, do you know what? He also briefly managed, uh, uh, what were they called? The Head Shrinkers in the WWF at mm-hmm. the time as well. I think when they were good guys, possibly. But uh, any particular stories about Lou? I don't know if you ever met him after that, you know, at conventions or anything. I've never been with him at a convention. He's gone, right? Has he passed away? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that was it tells you how close I was to him. But he he treated me fine. He knew who I was, <laughs> and for him to know who I was, I actually said that he kind of follows the business. Now, a lot of guys, when they finished up there, they didn't look back. They just said, well, that's the point of my life. I'm going, I'm, I'm doing something else and they're done with it. But Captain Lou knew who I was. And at that time you didn't have YouTube, you didn't have social media. So he had to hear it through the guys or the people that he, he had talked to who I was, which I, I appreciated that. And, uh, I wish I'd have, I never had my picture made with him. This was, a, this was, I would have a million pictures, except we didn't have the cameras on phones, camera phones, because you'd have to find a cameraman to take a picture, send you the picture. And I wish I'd have had a, I ha- had a picture with him, but I don't. Now, the men down under, formerly known, as the Bushwhackers, because for trademark reasons, they couldn't call themselves the Bushwhackers. You okay? <laughs> oh, God. And uh... Luke and Butch. <clears throat> My good friend, Luke. Mm-hmm. You ever interviewed Luke? Yes, I have. Love him to death. But he would talk in such a way, and you'd be looking at him. And... <laughs> Uh, great guy. And actually, I, I saw him not too long ago at a convention and he's still Luke. He's, and he has some stories about when he started wrestling down in New Zealand, then he went to Australia. Then I think Barnett, who was the Australian promoter, sold his company in Australia and came to the United States and he had the money right off the sale from the Australian territory, and he bought into Atlanta, the Ted Turner promotion, and took it from there. And he and he brought, I think he brought Luke to the United States. So we can blame Jim uh, Barnett. Jim, Hurd, Jim Barnett. I nearly said Jim Hurd. We can blame Jim Barnett indirectly for causing <laughs> what would end up being the worst match in recorded history to uh, television. Now, this is the men down under the Bushwhackers versus the Iron Sheik, who 
Uh, would it be unfair to say look pregnant with a hippo <laughs> at this point? And Nikolai Volkov. And uh, they were being, and apparently Nikolai Volkov was being managed by some just some guy in communist outfit, like communist military <laughs> outfit. And it turned out to be Nikolai's real life roommate at the time, who he just must have just dragged out and just said, "Just wear this." Again, we got no information about this match. I don't even know what we call the guy outside, unless we made up a name like Igor Rumanov or something. I don't know what we called him. It was something but it Brezhnev was, or something, I think. Oh, my God. And I rem still remember trying to come up with something to describe this match, why it's happening, and what they were doing. It's just, folks, if you, if, if you want to really feel helpless, I want you to go back, look at this match, and try to commentate it yourself and see what you would have come up with. I mean, I don't even think you could have been, usually my commentary is kind of funny, but this was so bad. I mean, if I was funny, it would be adding basically to the awfulness of it. Terrible. I, I don't even know who won the match. I don't care, really. Who won it? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, everyone was a loser. The fans, the viewing audience. Uh, the, the, uh, Randy Rosenblum yeah. even like he called like a backbreaker, and it was look like Ugh. you might as well just put him on the mattress. It was so soft. And then Randy goes a very soft looking backbreaker. <laughs> even he was calling how shit the film uh, the, the moves were. <laughs> oh, it was, it was it was it was terrible. And in in a regular crowd, this is how I know they were all gamblers, half drunk. And they were drinking in their seats. If that had been a paid crowd, half the crowd would have went out and went to concession stand. But no, they sat there. I don't remember any large groups walking out on anything and coming back, which would, which was what would have happened if it had been a paid crowd. But everybody just sat there. That's why they, they just give the tickets away just to get them in there, to make it look like they had interest in it, which they didn't at all. In a stupor, they were sat there, half drunk. <laughs> I don't know. I should have ordered some drinks. And if I'd have, thinking about it now, I should have called one of those, you know, guys walking the floor, and I said, "Hey, bring me, bring me something to drink." What? I don't care. Anything. Just bring me something. <laughs> the uh, Iron Sheik also did the Persian clubs routine, but uh, the the comedy of it was is that one that the clubs looked really small. Like, they couldn't have weighed much. And then the clubs were brought to Shiki by, uh, like, a 140-pound guy, like a really skinny fellow who actually just picked them up. There you go. So, like, anyone out of the crowd could have done it, basically, because they were so light. And then also Sheik would get on the microphone and call out Hulk Hogan and Bob Backlund in 1999. Shiki, baby. <clears throat> He never got over Hulk. He never got over Backlund. That was 1984, 85, I think. And he never got over it, that he was the champion for 28 days, and Hulk Hogan beat him for it, and he never stopped talking about it. The best thing I ever remember Sheiky Baby being in is Sergeant Slaughter. And it kind of made sense then. And they had a pretty good run. But, and when he beat Backlund, you know, I, I guess they could have stretched him being champion a little more and worked that Iran uh, controversy a little longer. But they had Hogan beat him in Madison Square Garden, and the rest is history. Uh, if you put any stock into star ratings, which I don't think we really do here, but Dave Meltzer <laughs> gave this minus 459.4 stars. Absolute zero. Still known among wrestling journalists, wrestling, anyone with eyes, as maybe the worst wrestling match of all time. But you know what? I, I almost think we could find a worse one. A pay-per-view? On pay-per-view? No, uh, I don't think you can find a whole show. No. Uh, that match. Independent, specifically independent, that match, yeah. Oh, that match? Okay. Uh, that Moresco woman and... 
Booker T's wife. Yep, Charmel. And I don't, I don't think it's as bad as is the one we're talking about, the tag team. At least Charmel had a little bit of control in it. It was bad, but it wasn't on Charmel's side. It was on the uh, Moresco. That was your name, Jenna. I don't know Jenna Moresco. Jenna Moresco. Oh my God, terrible. Hey, I've seen some bad matches in my time, but I've seen, I have seen entire, like what Jim Cornette calls the independent mud shows. I've seen mud shows better than this. <laughs> uh, and you said it drew 27,000 buys? Something like that, but it needed 40,000 to break even. I don't know why. All the high priced top tier talent that was on the show. What'd they sell it for? Oh, actually, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I suspect it would have been under under the WWS price. Who knows? Maybe it was thirty dollars a, a a buy. Who knows? At that time. figure that up. Twenty seven thousand times thirty dollars. Oh, What's twenty seven times three? Um, eighty one. So eighty one thousand. Well, no, eight hundred ten thousand. Oh, eight hundred ten thousand dollars. But then lop half of that off for the um, yeah four hundred thousand. And that talent list didn't come anywhere close to 400,000. Are the building, where'd they advertise it? Um, Nowhere. Hustler? I don't, popular mechanics? I don't know. <laughs> no, they made some money. They just acted like they didn't make money. You, you might be right there. We're going to move on to the next match. Uh, I'm just going to skip through this one. It's probably the best match. Uh, Tully Blanchard with bad knees defeats Stan Lane, who still like physically looked pretty good. Yeah, Stan's always stayed in good shape. Yeah, uh, Tully gave a spirited promo beforehand, uh, claiming he was bubbling up inside with rage. And um, horrible, horrible, horrible interview. But again, <laughs> I'm not blaming Tully. I'm blaming the director. They gave him nothing to say or why he was there. So they didn't even put the pay per view over during the show, <laughs> and why it came. And I don't. Uh, there's so much that we could have said. That could have made it better. Hell, we could have made it like a, like we were raising money for some, you know, underprivileged kids or something. Who knows? We didn't even have that. We should, we should have a fundraiser for overprivileged kids just to be obtuse. <laughs> Why not? Uh, also, also in my notes, I've put snooker wins with a crossbody off the top, uh, so I've clearly ruined my notes <laughs> With the Tully Blanchard, Stan Lane thing, I'll move on. Abdullah the Butcher versus One Man Gang performed a big fat man stinkery ending and a, in a lot of blood. Within the first minute, bleeding started to happen and a double count out. This is the only match the crowd enjoyed because they both bled buckets. And there was a bit where One Man Gang uh, just basically love tapped Abby on the head, like like from there to there, and just like that, and that whoosh, sliced his head in half, blood everywhere. Well, this match wasn't too bad for what they did. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> because it was working to both their strengths. That's what they do. They do brawling. And they did it good. And this match was probably the, the same match they would have in Japan. Mm -hmm. And it was controlled. And the fans may have liked it because at least it had structure. It had that. Then they count them out and let them go. Mass didn't go long, did it? Oh, six that, minutes? Yeah, probably about six minutes, something like that. Do you know what? I've never asked you a story on one man gang. Was uh, Am I thinking Crusher Broomfield or something like that he was? Broom, Crusher Broomfield was the name he went under when he first broke in underneath Randy Savage. What, and Randy, Randy Savage, trained him. No, Randy didn't train him. He's from Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's where he's from. Uh, <clears throat> but Randy started a, a, a territory up in Lexington, Kentucky, and crushed your work for him. And I think Randy either gave him the name or he brought the name with him. So what's, what question do you have? Uh, just general stories about One Man Gang. I've never asked you about uh, him ever on this show so I thought I don't know when the first time you even met him was well I told the story that we worked that independent show for those two guys right 
Remind and he me. went to work one. Well, he went to work with this guy, and the guy wanted to be a wrestler, but he wasn't very big. He's like 210 pounds, maybe. But his daddy had some money in this Mississippi town, I think. <clears throat> and he pissed off gang. And uh, Gang said, well, what do you want to do? He said, anything, anything. He just blew Gang off. Don't tell Gang anything, because anything to Gang means anything. So they went out there, and Gang, and he was the promoter of the show. And all his friends was there. His family was there. He's going to be a DQ anyway, I think. Gang whipped that son of a bitch. From go to woe. I, I mean, he laid it in. Oh, the guy said, oh, anything. And he says, uh, and he said, lay it in, lay it in. I'm hardcore. I'm okay. Gang weighed 400 pounds. And gang could still go. I was watching it. And I'm going, God. I was having trouble watching it. They had an old U-Haul trailer. They brought the ring in on it. They parked it inside the building. Gang threw him up in the U-Haul. <laughs> threw him against the back of the trailer that you couldn't even see because it was, you know, trailer was long in the back. Door was here. Threw him, and you just heard the sound. <laughs> and then he, th and then the next thing he threw him out, and you see him flying, flying out of the trailer, and beat him like a, a drum and they had to count out and come to the back and I'm watching and I go and dress room. I sit down and I said, Oh God. And the guy comes in and he's got a partner. They're all about 18, 19 years old, but they want to be big wrestling promoters. And gang walked in and the guy was crying. And the gang says, good man. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to shake his hand. He said, man, why did you hit me so hard? And gang says, well, you said lay it in. And he did say that. I heard him say it. And he just beat the crap out of him. And gang looked at me and went, <laughs> went so that, that's my story about uh, one man gang. I was with him in Puerto Rico. And then he left there. And I heard later, I don't know if he got sick or something happened. But and the last time I heard about gang, he was working as a guard in the Mississippi State Penitentiary on death row. And I ask, I've, I've talked to one man gang since then, and I've never known anybody that worked death row. And I asked him, how is it? He said, it's the quietest place in the prison. Because those guys are not raising hell. They're, they're probably thinking about where they're going to end up. And he says, it's pretty calm in here unless, and he says, it, it stays calm until they have an electrocution date. And then he said, it gets, when the guy goes, he said, it's loud. That's what they're doing. They're saying bye to him because they've lived with him for years, this particular inmate, and they take their cups and run it across the bars. He said, I don't know if that really happens or not. But interesting to hear about what, what goes on at death row, because it's always, uh, I, I just always wondered about that. Hmm. He didn't go to him. He, he doesn't go with him, with him to the chamber, but he has them right up to, they lead them those last, 30, 40, or 50 steps, or whatever they got to go. Yeah, I've seen quite a few prison documentaries, Louis Theroux and so forth, but they always say you can go anywhere in the prison apart from death row because you don't want to get them excited. You want to keep them as easy no, you want to keep them as possible. Yeah. yeah. Keep, he's, he told me that keep them calm down, keep them even tempered because the murderers, rapists, that they're the worst of the worst. And if you keep them, Calm down. You don't want anything to upset them. Anything, loud noises, anything like that, because they get upset. Then you got a problem. I don't. Well, I don't know what kind of problem they can't get out of the cells, but 
crazy. I, let me say this. I would not like a job like that. Yeah. Or maybe I could sit out there in the middle and tell them wrestling stories. May They may have liked that, may have calmed them down. Maybe one or two of them may have been a former independent wrestler. Who knows? See, that's one thing about independent shows you don't know. When you show up to an independent show, you if, if you don't know the guy or any of the guys in there, you don't know anybody. Hell, one of these guys could come in late and he just come from massacring his whole family or robbing a 7-Eleven or shooting a cop. You don't know because you don't, you don't know what kind of people they are. So anytime I go on an independent uh, show, very nice, very considerate, very polite, eh, because the nice thing I want to do is some guy in there's got a problem, and I say, get out of the way, and it's on. He don't care. He can make a name for himself for killing me, I guess. I don't know. Do you think there's any way we could show heroes of wrestling in uh, in the in the uh, prison? Because maybe after after that, maybe they might just be queuing up for the electric chair. <laughs> That's a good idea. We need to present that <laughs> to some states that still have capital punishment. We say, listen, guys, and I have thought of ways to kind of <clears throat> see a lot of people are against capital punishment. They're just against it. They, they're for abortion but they're against capital punishment. It's kind of a dichotomy there that, that butts heads. But we can say, listen, we can save you the trouble of going through all this is capital punishment humane. We'll take them down and we'll chain them to a chair and both feet to a chair, but leave one arm open. I invented this and we'll put a cyanide pill on a shelf within arm's range. And we will tell them that you got to watch this pay-per-view till eternity. Or you can take that pill and leave. I would say within the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes of heroes of wrestling, the guy would say, screw this. Give me the pill. <laughs> Boom. And they're gone. Therefore, you eliminate the electric chair, the capital punishment uh, debate, and the guy's gone. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'd, I'd have <laughs> like a button and like an anvil drop on him, though. I'd make it a bit more Warner Brothers style. You got to be humane. You have to be humane. Mm -hmm. If you drop it on your head, that's painful. But you take a sign and peel, blah, 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 they just bubble up, <laughs> then they're gone. We uh, well, but, but it's not you issuing. You're not pushing the button to do it. You know, to start the uh, the transfusion. It's nice to give them the, the option. They have. They're taking themselves out. Mm -hmm. See, and you have nothing to do with it. We said we give him an option. He could have lived. What do you what, think of that idea? Well, I don't. Know what a life it would have been. And you know, if they made it through the Bushwhackers Iron Sheik Nikolai Volkov match. <laughs> <laughs> they may not have made it through the uh, interview that Jake gives, which is probably one of the two most famous moments of this famously terrible pay-per-view. Now, I'm going to tee it up, and we, you and I, are going to watch it uh, together for the first time, so just one second. I think it's a former wrestler out of Memphis. I mean, uh, no. an announcer out of Memphis. Do you think? Let me hear his voice. Okay. Well, let me figure out how I'll play this first. Play it. Oh my God, Daily Motion. Very proportion, the man, Jake the Snake Roberts. He is a man that you all recognize. He's a legend. Come on, Jake, get on in here. The folks want to hear from you. You know, I'll tell you right now, it's just, you know, you get a casino, everybody says, well, gosh, Let me turn casino, it up you should gamble. Let me tell you something, Oh, it is turned up. Don't want to play cards with me because I'll cheat, okay? I cheat. You want to play 21? I got 22. You want to play blackjack? I got two of those too. You want to play aces and eights? Maybe I got too many of those too. Bottom line is this. You do not One gamble time. with me. The only thing you should gamble is this. Listen to me. When you walk in a casino, 
and you want to gamble, the main thing is you should realize this. To gamble, you must accept losing. I don't accept losing. Huh. And neither does Damien. Damien, my friend. My friend Damien is right here. Damien. Is he Damien? Yeah, just no, Jake is gesticulating to the floor oh. in a dirty old knapsack. <clears throat> Let me show you something. That could just be a pillow he got from the motel. For all it's Go worth. ahead, Anvil. Roll the dice. Mr. Cameraman, get your ass back up here. Hello? I'm talking to you. <laughs> get the camera back up here. <laughs> that is not what you need to worry about, Anvil. The bottom line is this. When the DDT comes, then the snake comes out. Worry about the DDT. 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 He was trying to get his own chant going. DDT. Think about it. A man of his word, Jake the Snake Roberts. There you go. <laughs> oh my god that's even worse than i imagined did you did you actually but, hear that over the speakers while you were doing yes, the commentary he, you heard it he, he was on the screen uh -huh. the, the big screen in the arena they put him on so I'm, I'm watching him jake i think you can tell was pretty well under the weather i saw jake earlier that day because he had a like a little restaurant leading into the into the casino and they had all like windows and you could look outside from inside the restaurant I saw Jake going in there well I saw him trying to get in there he was ripped and this is four hours before the the event started. Yeah, I was going to eat, and then I was going to go in and see what was going on. And Jake was, he, he went in, and he staggered in. And then I went in later. I saw he was sitting over there somewhere, and he was eating. And he had some people with him, or somebody with him. And then he went into the, I guess, the dressing room. I went to the desk. And I didn't see Jake, and this was like three hours later when that video played, but he was still hammered. So I think he took something in the dress room with him and continued his party inside the dressing room. And then that announcer who interviewed him, that wasn't uh, Rosen, what's his name, Rosenberg? Rosenbloom. That, that, that wasn't him. That was just some guy. I, I don't know who he is. Uh, no, I, I think he used to do uh, Memphis TV. I think that was him. But I think he had moved somewhere down there. Or he was available. But but anyway, the that gives you some idea of what Jake's condition is. Michael St. John, apparently. That's just... him. That's him. Right. Okay. He used to do Memphis wrestling. I've done it with him a couple of times in their... This is when after Lance had left and David left, the two and, main. And that was all he was left. <laughs> then, then Saint John and he was there, so that's that. I do know him very well, by the way. But it was to give you some clue of what to expect in uh, in Jake's match. Ah, uh, speaking of which, that ends up this. It's sort of the semi-main event. It's a bit confusing. It's meant to be Jake Roberts and Jim Neidhart in a singles. Now, the story behind this goes, for weeks beforehand, Jim Neidhart was agreeing to the finish, taking the loss via DDT. Yes, don't worry, I'll lose. And then comes to the arena that night, or as I like to imagine it, the riverboat where the casino was, swishing back and forth. And Neidhart says, I'm not going to do it because... I've possibly got a deal with the WWF to go back and team with the British Bulldog, who'd also just gone back to the WWF at that time. Now, that didn't happen. Jim uh, never went back uh, in a full-time capacity in that sense. And all it did was just 
cause a massive issue, really, quite frankly. So they ended up having to turn the singles match into a tag team match. Now, before we get to the tag team match, which is its own story, Jim Neidhart and Jake the Snake are wrestling or some approximation of pro wrestling in the ring for a few minutes, stumbling around. And then Jim Neidhart leaves the ring and Jake the Snake Roberts does something with the snake. Shall we have a look what it is? Oh, <laughs> go ahead. Show this. Okay, here we go. I'm out of here. Wait a minute. Do the commentary <laughs> for us, Dutch. I mean, do the commentary over yourself, I suppose. Well, I got to hear. Oh, look. Oh, this is it. What do you say to that? That's what I want to say. Look at the size. <laughs> Look at the size of that member. <laughs> oh my God! Now, what do you say here? Well, I'll tell you what you will notice is that the camera is now very much focused on the crowd for quite a while. Oh, there we go. It's still happening. And then um, I haven't told you this. I mean, you saw it at the time, Dutch, but. Then Jake, as we'd say over here, starts trying to get off with the snake in some way. He seems to start French kissing it, and basically he's just far, far too intimate. There we go. Now, um, I'm going to stop sharing there. Right, get back uh, on. Hey, where else are you going to see this, folks? Except on a wrestling pay-per-view. I mean... You're not even going to see it in like an Alice Cooper show. I don't think he ever tried to tongue kiss the snakes on the stage. Well, Jake, like I said, it was back in his wild days. And Jake, I I, I bet you if you talk to him now, he, he might not even remember that. He may not. He got out of the ring and some woman massaged his nipples. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, what? I mean, what do you say? Do you say, oh, there's a fan that's massaging Jake's little titties? And oh, there's nothing you can say other than you're done, you will embarrass yourself. So I just, I didn't try to have dead air, but there was nothing to say. I love that. Look when at the is... size of that thing. I didn't even realize you'd said that. <laughs> well, I kind of meant to say that. Look at the size of that. I kind of meant to say that, but <laughs> tongue in cheek, of course. It's trying to make a, but it didn't take, wait a minute, a, a brain scientist to figure out what that kind of a thing with the snake was. Mm hmm. Uh, as for the rest of the match, it doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, uh, Yoko Z Zuna and King Kong Bundy turn up and then turn it into a tag somehow, and then the promoter's hanging around as well to sort of... I don't know what the promoter's hoping his presence was going to do there. Uh, essentially, Jake did a good job of lying around, getting beaten up on the floor because he couldn't really get up, and then King Kong Bundy gets tagged in, splashes him, and then gets the pin. So Jake the Snake Roberts, the biggest star on the show, loses to the bad guys, but then in the end... The bad guys, I don't know, get the comeuppance. And then as the show is closing out, I won't show this, I'll just tell you. Uh, Jake somehow loses his boots. He's in his socks. And then at some point he's threatening <laughs> to either put the snake down his trousers or he's threatening to remove his trousers entirely. Um, I remember that. Yeah. Again, again, I, I'm speechless. All I can say is, what is he doing? I should have said, folks, he's been drinking all day, so what do you expect? <laughs> I mean, this is the stuff he probably does in his room, but he said, no, you paid for this pay-per-view, so I'm going to give you something to remember, and he did. What happened afterwards? So the cameras go off, go dark, and then what happens afterwards? Is Jake in the ring for 20 minutes naked, or what do you remember happening? No, he gets up and leaves. That was it. Like the fans... <laughs> Like the fans do, they just, they were all out of there in like three, four minutes. They're gone. They took off. And then most of the wrestlers have already gone anyway. And we all go back to our... Jake goes back to drinking, I'm sure. I went back to my room. 
I was leaving early the next morning. So I, I forgot where I flew from. I think I flew from Nashville. What year was this? 99. I was in Nashville, yeah. Hmm. So I flew back there and picked my money up and went home. And I tried to erase this experience from my memory, but no, thanks to you hmm. having, having people relive with me unpleasant experiences, I have to talk over this pay-per-view. This is your <laughs> fault. This is your fault. Last week, after we did the podcast, you said you should ask me a question about Jake the Snake Roberts, and you said... Ask me if I've ever seen Jake the Snake inebri- inebriated, if I can say the word. I mean, I'm sounding Yes, I have. And, and that's that, what I was thinking of yeah. right here. So that's why I was like, oh, well, we've got to do the pay-per-view then. So, I mean, in, in a kind of way, it's entirely your fault. Well, you can blame <laughs> it on me. I, I, I don't mind that. But, but, you know, when you see guys like that, Jake had a problem. He will admit he had a problem. Not only with alcohol, but with, with drugs. And I think he got with, um, Dallas page mm-hmm. and underwent a alcohol program to get him off of it. And I allegedly, I think it has worked because I think if, if, if Jake hadn't have done that, uh, I don't think Jake would be with us today. I really don't. And I think Diamond Dallas Page probably saved his life. How old is Jake now? Um, mid to late 70? 60s, something like that, yeah. I I don't know how old he is, but he's he looks like he has a few miles on him. Hmm. Let me say that. Uh, he's 68 years old. Uh, let me uh, just tell you this. I thought this was an interesting fact, that out of the four people in that main event, only Jake is still with us. And he was one who... And- yeah. And and if you looked at it, if you'd said then, who would be the last one to go? Jake would probably have been the first one to go mm. if you were trying to, and he's outlived him. But you got to give Diamond Dallas paid some credit for that too. And Jake, he had to go in there and want to do it. Otherwise, I think he'd be gone too. I mean, we're all going to go some way, but you would think Jake would have went uh, he had a ba- he had a bad habit. Mm-hmm. And the only other fact about this match is is that neither Jake nor King Kong Bundy were the legal men in the match. Just pin him and just get out. Uh, Heroes of Wrestling was meant to be on pay per view again the following February, and then quarterly shows going forward. But for obvious reasons, not least they didn't get enough buys. Uh, this plan uh, was cancelled, never to be heard of again. Uh, the show ends with Jake. I've already mentioned this. Uh, putting uh, also the snake on promoter Bill Stone. I've got the name in here as well. Uh, Jake had been doing interviews for local news and radio in the area in the run up to Heroes of Wrestling and actually been doing a very good job. You know, he was staying on the level and that kind of thing. And basically- he was doing interviews on the run up to it. Yes, in the days and after and after the show, we all did a run off, <laughs> get, a, get away from it. If you got the money, run as far away as possible. He also said in one of these interviews promoting Heroes of Wrestling that he wanted to clean up wrestling. Who? Jake did. Uh. <laughs> no, he didn't. He apparently this is this is a quote here. Uh, he wanted to clean up wrestling, is what Jake said. And what did that mean? Not what happened that night, I'm presuming. When did he say this? A few days before Heroes of Wrestling happened. So it's poor timing. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. Uh, or, very poor timing. Also around this time, it was reported that Jake's ex-wife, uh, knowing Jake was going to get a payday from the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view, had then demanded $5,000 in backdated child support, with Jake being threatened with jail if he didn't cough up. And then, as you say... He turned up in no fit state to perform. And then that's what the pay-per-view was. And that's pretty much it. That's the legacy of Heroes of Wrestling. Uh, you were probably the only good thing about it. Maybe Tully's slightly odd promo, but at least he meant it. And Stan Lane looked good. That's like saying you're the best player on a football team that went 0-12. and 12. You're the nicest guy in prison. You're the <laughs> nicest guy in death row with... Crusher Broomfield looking after but you. But you know, 
it was booked wrong, totally wrong. You could tell that whoever booked it didn't book it with styles in mind. Otherwise, that uh, the Iron Sheik and whoever his partner was would not have been booked against those other two guys because that's that's horrible. Abdullah and uh, One Man Gang, they're okay because you actually worked their style. But the rest of it, it was – it didn't, it didn't, they didn't even really have two good guys working with each other in the whole show. Seemed like you would have wanted to work two guys really to go out there and bust their ass for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and give them a, a good wrestling match. They didn't even do that. Well, well, that it was, was the all point gimmicks. With, that was the point with two called Scorpio being on quite early, but then like he was put with someone who was really green, and then it didn't quite work out either. So anyway, it probably is the worst pay-per-view of all time. I think we can agree, and on that note, we're going to shut down this podcast. Thank you very much for watching. We've got books, we've got T-shirts, we've got iTunes. We're on twice a week now, Fridays and Tuesdays, and we are going to catch you this Tuesday for our weekly new episode where we answer your questions. So if you want to submit a question to us, go to questionsfordutch at gmail.com. And Dutch, I thought you wanted to say something. I've said all I have to say. That's fine. Otherwise, if anybody wants to talk to me, write me an email, tell me how bad James is, I'll listen to you. Uh, Email me, dirtydutchmantel with two L's at gmail.com and yeah. I'll talk to you. Yeah, and buy stuff from Dutch as well. But for now, thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you again on Tuesday. We the people, Dutch. <laughs> we the people. <laughs>